Welcome to Future Sense Now, where we explore the landscape and byways of our shared futures, an easing of the Futures Forum Live online. We exchange ideas, information, and inspiration about the futures we want. Get Future Sense Now with host Dr. Claire Nelson, futurist and editor of Human Futures. And welcome to Future Sense Now, an online e magazine of the Futures Forum. We are live online. It is March 2020, and we're celebrating Women's History Month with an exploration into the future history of women, women 2030 and beyond. And why? Why 2030? Well, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number five speaks specifically to the development and inclusion of women. Of course, in recent years, we have seen social and political movements such as hashtag me too, hashtag times up, and this year's conversation is hashtag each for equal. But what might we expect of the future history of women in the Industry 4.0 era? How might issues around data, hmm, privacy, ah, impact on how women's lives, women's opportunities, and the challenges for inequality and inequity emerge. So to have this conversation, I am joined today by Andrea Roxana Stancio. She is originally from Romania, now living in New York, who believes in the equal access to knowledge and technology. She's working continuously to ensure and enable human-centered innovation through technology transfer at a global scale. So she holds a master's degree in information technology and data science, but let me just say, she started off as a math wonk, nerd, geek, whatever. Yay, for the engineers and the mathematicians. So in addition to her work as a full stack developer in Europe, most importantly, she founded the Global Innovation Consortium in 2017. So it's a very recent movement. And she's also co-founder of something called Real World. She just started that. It's a social filmmaking platform. And she's founder and executive director of Europe Future Summit. So as a futurist, I'm so excited to meet this young woman who is engaging in the startup economy from emerging industries and frontier markets as a leading the Global Partnerships and Global Startup Ecosystem Academy. This platform is about disrupting access to resources and training for startups in 90 countries, 90 countries in all seven continents, regions on the planet. So, without further ado, but wait, 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 one more thing. Let me just add her superpower. Yes, supergirl, superwoman. She has the ability to translate natural processes into code, algorithm, and business solutions. And why? Because she happens to speak four, four languages. So, it's very easy for her to speak multiple programming languages. Without further ado, let me welcome my new friend, because I have to have some new friends in a young age, and I want to make sure I keep young and I learn a lot. So my new friend, Andrea. How are you, Andrea Roxana? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Claire. I'm very well. That was a great introduction. <laughs> it's nice to hear, to hear what you're doing uh, from other people, because I'm having a hard time usually. I, I'm involved in so many things, but there's one thing that that drives everything that I do. That's my my interest and my innate um, um, my innate uh, involvement in everything that surrounds technology, innovation, and focuses on the sustainable development goals. So I want to jump right into it because we don't have much time. Let me just say, first of all, as you think about um, goal number five, right? And you see you're doing eco startup. One of the things that I want to ask you, how, I mean, how do you think your work is going to emerge in 2030? I wanted to say, for those who don't know, the ICTs were not considered specifically a separate goal, right? So it's not a separate goal in terms of equity. But most of us recognize the ICTs and space as sort of the 
interstitial spaces. If you think, 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 think of your body, you have the organs, but you have the interstitial space. So ICT and space, you can't do without. So they don't have to be separate goals, but we understand we must ensure that there's equity. So tell me about how you see 2030 emerging when you think about this issue of digital access, digital divide, equity, all of these things you know, that are driving the, poss the possibility for a flourishing future. That's an amazing question. I see 2030 as reaching, uh, as having all the goals as, as practices, uh, having them in our daily routines without thinking that it's something that we, that's distant in the future, but it's something that we incorporate in our personal lives, in our businesses, in our uh, relationships, in our uh, partnerships in everything. I, I see it as, uh, um, as not as an ideal, but as a practice. I, I think that in 2030, we're gonna, we're gonna put some KPIs on, on this already existing practices because we've seen, um, I always, I mean, it's my, it's my, uh, studies, but I always, I always thought that, um, Coding by itself cannot exist. You have to put coding in an universe of serving a purpose. Mm -hmm. So it's just translating into machine language, a practice, something that's a routine. In the same way um, as I think coders will be the next generation of blue collar workers, this sustainable development goals have to be a daily practice mm. uh, i don't want them to get diluted like every movement was me too and um diversity inclusion and all this i don't want them to get diluted i want them to become a daily like a daily checklist when you do your stand-ups in the morning with your teams you you check them all is our company aligned with this? Is, this? is the task that we're performing today, including women, is including, um, does it add, um, decreases poverty? So th that's how I see it. Wow, I think that's a very powerful um, statement. I really, and I think um, you have language it so beautifully because this idea of making it a daily practice one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast is really because I have this notion that um, having worked for 30 plus years, I hope I'm not older than you, 30 plus years in development, I have this notion that I've seen all these ideas come and go, like flavor of the month, flavor of the year, whatever, right? And we don't see what I call the paradigm shift up here and up and in here that really is required to make change happen. So as I read your um, bio um, and I saw this thing about, first of all, this real world, I want to tell a bit more about the social filmmaking platform because storytelling is so vital, right? We have all these dark films, these dystopian films, but we're not seeing what I call normative world where we're still going to live, we're still going to have problems, we're still going to have fights with our husbands and our brothers and our sisters, but we're going to have a normal world. So tell me about how this real world social filmmaking platform works and how do you see helping to change a narrative for equality and equity? Great. Uh, um, real world is a very dear project to me as I'm involved in it for the past year. Um, we believe that audience participation is the future of filmmaking because you need people to like, Hollywood, there's a disconnect between Hollywood and the social media and everything, all the content that's created out there. So it needs to be curated. And who curates it better than the audience that consumes it? So uh, Real World aims to build movies with the world and content with the viewers. Having them, an, having them actively participating in the creative process using all, all your superpowers to not only sit behind a, a screen and watch, but actively uh, shifting the narrative and improving and creating that story together. You're, everyone wants to be a superhero, but we got used and we, we grew up watching movies with superheroes. So what if, you're the ne what if you're the next one? And being a superhero doesn't require wearing a, 
wearing, a, I don't know, a Superman costume. <laughs> Being a hero requires uh, showing up for the women in your classroom when you're in high school. Being a hero requires uh, uh, helping someone to get a job if they're unemployed. Um, wow. So well, that's your whole, your whole, I mean, I'm so excited to be talking to you because it's very rare I have the opportunity to get into the mindset of millennials like yourself who are actually on the change, front lines of change. As a change maker myself, from my era, do I still trying to make change today at my age? I'm just excited about the possibilities for the intergenerational conversation and partnership that I really think could make a big difference. So when you talk about this idea of social filmmaking um and let's say let's put it now into say the idea of a startup uh, ecosystem right which is what you're exactly. working on. so what if how would you anticipate right as you think about this future creating let's say a future story about the success of women say you're working with women all around the world of women say creating a new market system which is more fair for women say who are working in the current blue collar workers like say working in sweatshops in Amazon Asia or Africa I'm just making this up but how would you see that sort of community of all the pieces of your life you know you have these things you're doing how yeah. do you see them being integrated into this change making driver that you, you sound like you're really intent on so I'm, I'm leading global partnerships for a global startup ecosystem and also I'll be leading the academy that we're launching. Um, so I'm focusing, I live by the Sustainable Development Goal Partnerships, which is number 17, if I'm not mistaken. It is number 17, you're not mistaken. So it's about aligning yourself with all the people that, uh, that you having this kind of a life, lifestyle of, um, of living, living the goals, implementing them, and aligning yourself with people that are doing the same. Yes. So if we were to say, we have a lot of applicants who, you would be amazed what ideas they have. Last year, one of the winners that pitched in front of our, our main partners, Forbes, um, they were building a mental health platform, mental health coaching platform for young athletes. Just because, as you said, there's, there's this intergenerational transfer, knowledge transfer that has to happen from people that have dealt. There's, and even if you look at it, there's a lot of old business models that up to this day, they bring revenue. They are profitable. They are just behind in terms of the technology and um, the technology they use and how they use all this new social media and all the new platforms to make their, make their lives easier and bring more users, customers and all this. So we see a lot of women that are very interested into um, uh, hygiene products, hygiene products and education on how to use and when and how, so, uh, or what these products are made of, sustainable um, uh, materials. And uh, we've seen, uh, sorry. <clears throat> so it's a, it's, a, it's a broad, we can talk for the next 10 hours, I think, on, on <laughs> how many ideas women have. Yeah. and how they need to be supported. But I would just say this, that always it's, uh, it's aligning yourself with, uh, with those who, who have the same goals. Mm -hmm. And one of my biggest, one of my mantras is, money is the result, is not the goal. I want, I want to work with people that are aware that money come and go, but they know that something that you build and it's sustainable, Mm -hmm. They have a purpose. When yeah. I launched, so I launched the Global Innovation Consortium because I wanted to to align myself with people that that see the importance of technology, mm -hmm. but without putting it in front of the human condition. Yes, yes, yes. And 
I uh, I have in in the consortium of innovators from all over the all industries uh -huh. like movies uh, and, you know, manufacturing it's not all about tech is enabled by technology but not not focused solely on the technology and what we are doing with global startup ecosystem is giving access and disrupting disrupting this um access to to education and resources to underdeveloped markets emerging markets and frontier in especially frontier frontier markets and emerging industries uh -huh. because it's very beautiful to observe what's happening when technology marries uh the way the way your your i don't know um harvesting coffee yes. in in rwanda yes. or how you do um shopping in in europe for example yeah 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 you know that is interesting you brought up the coffee i'm going to kind of switch to something completely different but what brought what brought what was brought to my mind immediately was um i was speaking to some coffee farmers in jamaica and the coffee prices have dropped and at the same time we have kingston their farms are in the mountains above kingston and they've just started bringing cruise ships back to Kingston, well, before the virus, but who knows. But anyway, the point is, I said to them, you know, I've been really thinking about for years how we might get you guys to be able to benefit from agritourism. And so I've been thinking, how would I get them, because they're mostly older people, how could I find somebody young in Jamaica to work with me to help them? Because, I mean, I'm here, I'm not there all the time, but I would like to help them. I really feel, I've been thinking about this for like five years now and I still haven't done it because I can't find the right young person on the ground who can help me help them. So I'm going to keep on thinking about it and putting out the vibes that somebody that grew up in that neighborhood who is doing technology could say, okay, I can create the platform for them okay. to market their homes as come and stay on a farm for a night kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. and help come up with the rating and all that stuff. So you're right. Um, I want to ask you about the idea of the inequities around, let's say, data science and how, what are some of the things that worry you about how data science is, might be used in, improperly or inappropriately to spread discord? Or this, what, is, what are some of the things that you think about and you worry about? And AI. Yeah. Um, I would say that I'm not worried because um, there is there is a risk, mm -hmm. but you always have to look at who's at who's implementing. Um, even with all the content out there, and even with the inf the information, we all read the the terms and conditions and the agreements like you know you scroll and then you just press okay and then you end up thinking oh they it's just being more informed will save a lot of will save a lot of uh, people from troubles um but uh, i started i've seen this growing and it's just a trend it will die down because um We've seen the big scandal with GDPR and the Facebook uh, scandal last years and Congress and all this, but only because technology was more advanced than the policy. Mm -hmm. So the beauty of technology is that it also pushes policy changes. But we need people in, in, the, in the capacity to, to sign laws and bills to be informed and that's it's a big problem though because half of the people in congress or the mayors in these cities or whatever unfortunately most of the people going to politics are like you know lawyers and political science people and so we find we find that they don't have a strong sense of uh they don't have a strong sense of knowledge about technology they're not futures literate and one of the things that i'm involved in is a movement to help create futures literacy another reason why i'm doing this podcast that take up so much of my time is that not because i you know just say rightly you do something not because it has money attached to it because you're passionate about the fact that you really have to have this conversation globally about um 
you know, how the future is emerging and locally, because when we look about our shared future, my four questions are how we share a planet, how we share our humanity, health, health issues, etc. How we share the rule book, you know, the rules around, you know, internet laws and making sure that we don't have lack of access because they change the rules and it becomes too expensive for regular poor people. And then how we say, share decision making. And those two last issues, how we share on the rule book around things like data laws and privacy laws and how we share decision making, like who gets to sit at the table, you know? Um, I'm assuming you would know more than me, and please tell me, are enough women in the decision-making uh, chairs in the rule book making policy around data privacy or data laws, or is it that there is no distinction between how the data could be used? Is, in other words, does data have a gender, or can it be gendered? That, that's a kind of weird question, maybe, but I hope you get what I'm saying. I I'm 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 trying to so <laughs> trying uh, to get what I'm saying because I mean we're talking about the future of women right mm -hmm. and we're talking about the future is female but we're now embedded in a matrix of data so my question is can data and AI and machine learning be used incorrectly to further disadvantage women? women's march women's forward march or for the break women's forward march i think it's, that's probably a simpler question uh, it can be used in the same way to to disadvantage men you see i um it, it depends on who you who uses it yeah. and the, the person who's gonna be the more most informed uh -huh. is gonna be able so we have to uh, we have to make sure that the people that are getting informed they get the information and they, they do what they should. For example, if an organization that's aligned with the sustainable development goals gets information about the future, the march uh, does, not, um, does not use it um, to, to disrupt, I mean, to, to put it to, to a stop. Um, it's uh, I have a question. Sure. I would you think because you, for example, let's say you are doing this global ecosystem startup and this global yes. startup academy, right? And we have a challenge where a lot of women in the era of like the older women who are in politics, for example, as I said, we're not scientists or, or, or engineers. Women and men alike, fine. But even some of the young aides and the young assistants that are going in to support the CP in Congress or the mayor's offices, they're also not, let's say, STEM, you know, very literate. Even if they are quote unquote, even if they are tech savvy because they're born after the year 1990. So I guess another question I would ask you is, as somebody who is really passionate about this idea of ensuring human-centered innovation and change, is there something that in your global partnership or in your global innovation consortium that you can do something to ensure those aides and advisors and young people who are working in policy and politics better understand the implications of machine learning and AI? So in other words, since they're not, as you said here, you want to make it available in a very easy way. Is there something that your group could do to ensure that that understanding is there, because that is one of my fears, quite honestly. This is why we're hosting 54 summits around the globe. And now because of the coronavirus, we're gonna have uh, around 30 in person and the other 24 will be digital. So creating these platforms where people all ages, all genders can come together and can focus the conversation on the issue, uh -huh and not on the technology. Uh -huh. For me, I mean, I always, maybe giving you a short story will help you understand better my position. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in Romania. My grandfather was an accountant. And of course, I, I'm lucky that he supported me. He was always pushing me to speak German and he was, we were watching together the TV series Dallas. So I started to learn English and he, he was asking me to translate, but he also had me help him 
with the balance sheets. So he was an accountant, so I had to calculate to learn how to calculate those immense sums. <laughs> and I barely could write. I was like five, six years old. And then that's how I would spend my summers with my grandfather. <laughs> And then I went, I went to visit my mom and my mother was, uh, was among the first uh, uh, programmers, female programmers. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was programming on punch cards. Like me. <laughs> so I, in my head, uh, I made this, this realization that if I learn to do what my mom does, I can do what my grandpa has me doing, but much faster. Yeah. So I can have enough time to play, to go travel and all this. So just because I'm, I was in between two generations, yeah. you know, and I've seen the way things were done. Yeah. I, I, I immediately in my head was, and that's how I look at, at software. That's how I look at technology. It's just, it's just a tool. Mm -hmm. It's something that enables me to do things faster, to eliminate routine. And it puts me in the power position. A lot of people now are scared that robots will take, will take their, their workplace. It won't because there are some things that, first of all, that robot will have to be programmed by a human. Of course, there are algorithms that if you let them execute, they, they behave differently. But that's maybe one percent. So empathy will never be able to be automated. <laughs> They're and trying. They're trying. They're trying to train robots how to recognize emotions. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, but it's still and in my perspective also. Perspective is not something that can be automated. Not yet, at least. So in what I've seen in the I'm born 1985, so it was elementary school, high school, university, then the master's degree, and then around 10 years of experience. Let's say what I've seen in my 35 years of life so far in terms of technology is, is the beauty of the science, but in the same time is how it pushes progress and, and change mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and policy. Mm -hmm. and, um, with 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 the human being at the at the in the driver's seat you know yeah 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 when you think about um so you're saying basically just a recap that again uh between your lens as somebody who's actually trying to start up ecosystems understanding technologies across the world with women especially who they the academy you're starting um, it's going to have trained women and others, but women as well, women especially, yes. to be drivers of the whole economy. Um, do you think, on a, as you said, on the empathy side, right, and on the perspective side, that the, we are now entering the era, really, of a female energy driver? And I say female energy as opposed to women. The female energy being becoming a driver, moving away from, even though we look like we're not there yet, like all this stuff going on, but do you think that we're approaching that point where female energy, which is said to have more empathy and a more ability to do much more broad perspective, build consensus, um, do you think we are, based on what you young people are doing together as men and women, right? From all around the world, do you think that the prognosis of people in my age group that says, ah, it can't happen in the next 30 years is flawed? Because in other words, because we are not living in your heads, right? We might think it will take another, you know, 50 years to get there. But from where you stand, as somebody who is driving change right now, do you think we can get past where we are, this rocky shows, in less than the you know, the, the 30 years that I'm thinking of? Uh, again, great question. I think that um, women, uh, female energy was always pushing, but it was, I just think that now it's the era when they are visible. Mm -hmm. 
there there were female engineers all the i mean i'll always get back to engineers because that's that's my studies and that's my core uh -huh. but um I I don't I see that females are just coming now and they're seen and as equal and the conversation is not on what gender the person is but on what the issue that that person is presenting. Mm -hmm. is. So moving a bit I I feel that it's being acknowledged that female energy um which is for the more empathetic Yes. More patient, more wants to build more consensus. Do you find that is happening? Like in all of these global movements that you're working on, do you find that even the men, the young men in those groups feel comfortable operating in that space? You can, you can tell about their upbringing and you can tell that in different cultures, there's, there's still a shift that has to happen. Mm -hmm. I had the immense pleasure to work and raise the first generation of entrepreneurs in Oman, in the Middle East. And I remember when I was asked to recruit from a, from a, a pile of resumes that I was given, and I, wa I, I didn't know how to tell a name, a female name from a male name. Ah. I didn't know. So I only chose based on the skills on the curriculum. <laughs> really? I think guess what happened when i went to to the higher ups and said i want to interview these people this is the people that i want to add to my team and they were like so just be i was the only woman working with 16 men so they said so you want to bring only women and i'm like i don't know how to tell a name i don't know if they're female or male i only look so from those five <laughs> Four were women and one was male. <laughs> that, yeah. is so, that is so, no, actually it's a very powerful story. That is a very powerful story because it speaks to, I think, what some people are trying to do in hiring bias here in America. Yes. Where you're saying, if you have a black sounding name, then your resume gets thrown to the bottom of the pile, you know? Yeah. So you're right. So this is something that I hadn't thought about, but this is, that's a good story. Um, now, as we, we, we're coming to a close, I want to find out from you um, this new paradigm then. Um, if you had to say what your paradigm for the work you're doing is, I like, first of all, the one you said, this has become a practice. May, perhaps we can encapsulate that so we can remember it, so we can... It can take a life of its own. Could you have um, share that again for me? We talk about a new paradigm. We're talking about this idea of collective wisdom, this global sharing you're doing. What would you like to add to this idea about the practice and the global ecosystem and this data? And um, I would like the access to to technology and and education to be one of the human rights because everyone should have access to information um, and education um, when it comes to female energy to be honest i wouldn't want to be uh i w wouldn't want to be in a room just because i'm female i would like to be in that room because my experience uh and my expertise validates my role there Mm -hmm. I don't want to be just because now it's now it's cool to hire more women. Now it's cool to have more diverse uh, diverse uh, people in your team. But I don't want this. Com I don't want in twenty thirty this conversation to still exist. We have to look beyond. You know, we're more much alike than we're different. So I would love for us to sit in a room and discuss. Uh, ideas and discuss and action and make an action plan mm -hmm. uh, based on on our skills and not on our gender mm -hmm. that's very good would you say you're optimistic pessimistic or neutralistic about getting there so i have to say that i'm very uh i'm very pleased to see how how things things evolve Mm -hmm. I would just like to put uh, somehow like a break into this delusion of, of um, 
of terminology. Um, and again, I would remove from uh, I would remove from a resume the gender, the country of origin, and the the weight, for example. It's not, but some they ask you the height and the weight, and they ask for a picture. So um, mm. I am optimistic because I've seen like from working being the only woman in a team of sixteen other. Uh, people which were men i I have now a platform that i 'm very grateful for, and there are more and more women that are speaking up mm -hmm. but i wouldn 't want us to leave the men behind in terms i I love this 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 pa this um, balance the balance I love the balance, and we need them to be partners because there 's a lot of things that we can learn from them as they learn from us that if you don't raise your voice, then it's much better and you can have, you can get faster to a result if you don't um, yell or anything uh, or something similar. So I would just say that I am optimistic. I've seen what I see at our events, at uh, all the speakers, they all acknowledge now the importance um, of this balance. Mm -hmm. And also the conversation that's around um, that's around the skills and the expertise, and not on the on the person who has that. Yeah, and so so wrap it up now. Tell me, you're in 2030. You have done this thing. You have a very clear vision of where you want to go. I want you to share with me your and uh, your storyteller. You're doing film. So if you have by the time done some films on real world, etc. What is the headline story from 2030 that you will be seeing um, in some news outlet somewhere um, about women and what you would have achieved? Hmm. Oh, it's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> I have to say, I would remove completely the conversation about gender, uh, even though I, I am a woman uh, and I am... Um, what is SDG 5? SDG 5, where would we be? Yes. SDG 5, it's having women in all fields, um, looking at, like now we've had the, the US team, soccer team winning the, the, champ, the world championship. So I... I would like to get to be a norm for women to be in any field and to not feel that they they don't belong that belonging of women in any field and in any in any capacity we've had the all women uh, walking um, in space we've we have uh, in Finland the all women parliament um so when it, uh, sorry as I hear what you're saying, it's, I hear you see, you're saying the headline would be like SDG 5 has achieved whatever it, you know, and these things are no longer surprises. Exactly. I, yeah, like, the, yes, yes, it's not, it shouldn't it's no be. No more for us. <laughs> being a norm, being the normal, being the normal, you know, like, uh, as there were people who, who fought a lot for women to, to have the right to vote. Uh, and we're celebrating um, these days um, the International Women Month, the Her Future Summit that I would love for you to to participate uh, to understand that yes, the woman's place is to raise a family, but a woman cannot raise a family by herself. She has to do it with her partner, uh -huh. with the man. And the same way in business, and the same way I'm fortunate to have. Uh, uh, partners in my projects that are both women and men. Uh -huh. uh, we are learning even as women that are very, it's as competitive as it is to, to, uh, to compete with men. Is it amongst women as well? So that's a thing that I wouldn't want to see in 2030. Yeah. I would like for it to become normal to support each other and not feel threatened um uh, yeah. by by our uh, fellow um women uh, workers um colleagues sorry um 
so it's um I would like for it to be to be a normal thing to to yeah. be a woman. So, so, so maybe the head down would be like gender equity is the new normal. Yes, yes, gender, yeah, fifty fifty, or it depends on the population. Of exactly, the and the and the issue, but the new normal. Yes. Awesome. And, yeah, just being uh, this one to one. You know, in mathematics, it's all one and zero. <laughs> um, so I would want to be one to one, and um, okay. and the more women, the more uh, the the better the the business also. And I would love. The other day, someone told me, a guy told me, because you know New York is pretty rough, and um, I was told that um, I'm too direct. So I would love for that conversation to not exist in 2030 because I was... <laughs> New York is very direct. I'm sorry. Well, New York is very direct. Yeah, but if, apparently I'm too direct. Even for a New Yorker, I'm too direct when it comes to, when it comes to, um, to some uh, uh, networking skills. And um, I was like, it's 2020. I cannot believe that a guy still tells me that I'm rough around the edges. This conversation, <laughs> this conversation should not happen. And then they tried to they then they tried to apologize, and I'm like, listen, the best apology is an, is a change of attitude. So next time something like this happens, <laughs> please behave differently, and that will help because. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of fluff and a lot of uh, courtesy and a lot of um, a lot of ways to tell things. But um, sometimes <laughs> the, the direct and honest truth is the best uh, is the best way to communicate. <laughs> and with that, <laughs> the very direct <laughs> Andrea Roxana Stanchu, we bring this conversation to a close. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Future Sense Now, Voicing Her Story. Yeah? Thank you for having me. Yeah, that's it, folks. We have been on Future Sense Now with Andrea Roxana Stancio. Again, I must say that she is doing some great work with the Global Innovation Consortium, with the Real World Platform for Social Filmmaking, and as director, executive director of Europe, Future Summit and Women Future Summit that she does in New York. Uh, she's also leading the Global Partnerships and Academy for the Global Startup Ecosystem, which is everywhere in the world. So exciting. So we've come to the end of this conversation, a great conversation, but the story continues being written by all of us. Remember, creating the future is our shared responsibility, and it is better to be the parent of our future rather than the child of our past. And so, as we say in Jamaica, walk good and safe journey. Thank you for listening to Future Sense Now with Dr. Claire Nelson. Future Sense Now is produced by the Futures Forum in Washington, D.C. For more information, visit www.thefuturesforum.org. Remember, our futures are embedded in the landscape of our present stories. Seize the day, share this story, and share the future.